Good, I think we'll get started. Hello, everybody, and welcome. My name is Anita Kassoff, and I'm the director of the Baltimore Museum of Industry, and tonight we are thrilled to be partnering with WIPR and senior producer Aaron Hankin to uh, bring you our members-only preview of our new podcast, Sparrows Point, an American Steel Story, uh, which tells the story of Bethlehem Steel and the people who worked and lived in the company town. Um, the podcast is an audio storytelling project that seeks to amplify the voices of Sparrows Point, people who spent their lives working at the mills, people who lived in the company town there, um, and it asks us to consider what the human costs are when manufacturing jobs disappear. We're grateful to our sponsors, Trade Point Atlantic and Maryland Humanities for making the podcast possible. And we're so glad to be partnering with WYPR to create the podcast. I think that this partnership is a really great example of how two anchor institutions in Baltimore can up our games and bring you even better content when we work together. Uh, if you're familiar with Aaron's groundbreaking work on the Out of the Block series, then you know he has an amazing ability to connect with the people he's interviewing and to make their experiences into really powerful stories. So we're really thrilled um, that he is working on this podcast uh, with us. Um, the podcast series is part of the, of the Baltimore Museum of Industry's uh, Bethlehem Steel Legacy Project which is a multi-year initiative achieved in partnership with Trade Point Atlantic um, that includes a preservation initiative or preserving historic objects and photographs from the Bethlehem Steel Mill, a community outreach and engagement uh, project, and a series of exhibitions about the steel mill and its history. And of course, programs like tonight are made possible thanks to the generous support of you, our members and donors. If you are a member of both the BMI and WYPR, then you get a gold star. Thank you very much. But um, if you're interested in learning more about becoming a member, um, I encourage you to visit our respective websites because your support will help ensure that we can continue to engage people in important conversations like the one we're looking forward to tonight. Um, just a few bits of housekeeping before we begin tonight's presentation. The discussion is being recorded and it will be posted on the museum's YouTube channel in the next few days. Um, your cameras and microphones are turned off, but we do invite your participation. If you have questions, please put them in the Q&A feature, feature at the bottom of your screen. And if you have any technical difficulties, put those in the chat, I think would be best. Um, we anticipate that this discussion will wrap up by 8 p.m. And now it is my pleasure to turn things over YPR's president and general manager, LaFontaine Oliver. Thank you so much. Uh, good evening and welcome everyone. Uh, my name is LaFontaine Oliver and I have the absolute pleasure of serving this community as the uh, president and general manager of WYPR 88.1 FM here in Baltimore. Um, I'd like to start by extending a big thank you to our partners at the Baltimore Museum of Industry uh, for making tonight possible um, thank you very much, of course, uh, to Anita Kasoff, and uh, thank you to the BMI's amazing team. Um, we're just really grateful for your vision uh, for this Sparrows Point, Point uh, podcast, and uh, we're just proud to be partners uh, in this new project studying Baltimore's uh, steel industry. Um, I'd also like to thank everyone who's joining us this evening uh, with an extra big thank you to all of the WYPR members who are on the call tonight, please give yourselves a hearty uh, virtual round of applause. We thank you so much. Uh, members truly make it all happen for Baltimore's NPR news station. Um, tonight, I, I represent a, a small but mighty team of talented people who make everything that you hear on 88.1 possible. Um, so please, if you are not a member, uh, as Anita mentioned, uh, please consider visiting wypr.org and you can make a calendar year in contribution after tonight's event. Uh, and we thank you so much uh, for your support of the station. So now to the exciting part, um, I have the, the pleasure and the honor of introducing Aaron Hankin. Um, as you heard, um, Aaron's done wonderful works with, uh, with Out of the Blocks. Um, he creates original 
uh, radio programs and podcasts for WYPR. And since the onset of the pandemic, uh, he's been busy producing and hosting WYPR's daily news podcast, The Daily Dose. Um, Aaron's work has been uh, heard on Morning Edition, on All Things Considered, uh, PRI's Studio 360 uh, and the world. And if all of that uh, were not enough, uh, he is simply one of Baltimore's coolest people. Um, so please uh, join me now in giving a warm welcome uh, to Aaron. Thank you very kindly. Both of you guys, that was, a, that was an excellent formal introduction. You see, I've got my finest flannel shirt on for the occasion. Uh, coming to you live from my, um, uh, my uh, little office here at an otherwise deserted WIPR at the moment. I go for a sort of a supply closet chic here. Um, but uh, yeah, we're, you know, we're, we're in here a couple of people at a time, a couple hours at a time, keeping the place running. Uh, sounding the way it should for you guys. And I'll just, you know, I'll just echo uh, what LaFontaine said. Um, you know, you guys, you make it possible. This is, I mean, this project, uh, this special project with the BMI is, I mean, this is your pledge dollars at work. So thank you. I mean, you guys, I owe my job to you. And I never, never forget that uh, every time I walk in this building and go to work. I want to say thanks uh, to the BMI for, um, I think, really, thinking outside the museum bubble uh, and entrusting an outsider with a, a project like this. Um, I personally am always comfortable, quite comfortable with my own ignorance. Um, and uh, I think the listener uh, ultimately to this podcast is going to benefit from the fact that I, I, I come at this knowing nothing. You really kind of start, there's not a whole lot of inside baseball talk here because I'm learning everything along with you about this story as your host. Um, I just really, uh, um, I, I'm a real evangelist for the beauty of the podcast as a, as a really accessible form for storytelling these days. Everyone with a device can, you know, find the player of their choice. And by the time this is up and running, I think already, in fact, uh, it's, uh, there's a feed for it. You can find it on uh, most of your podcast players. I'll, I'll get into the specifics of how you, can, how you can log on and make sure you're subscribed um, at the end of the presentation. I've got about uh, 25 minute presentation. I'm going to leave time for, to hear from you guys. Uh, I know that, um, some of you in the audience are people that I interviewed, uh, for this podcast. So I know you'll keep me on my toes too. Um, anyway, podcasts, they're great. They're great vehicles for stories. And Sparrow's point is, is it's not only an important historical topic. It's also just in its bones, a really great story from a storyteller's standpoint. It's got this, this very captivating narrative arc. It's got glory. It's got hubris. It's got twists and turns and sidebars and rabbit holes all along the way. And um, really importantly, uh, it's, it's got fantastic character. And I've, I've had a really fun time um, meeting the cast of characters that that you're going to hear from in this podcast series. I've got, it's been a couple of months of uh, recording interviews uh, and the way I've done it uh, at a safe distance in the midst of this pandemic is I've gotten to hang out on a lot of uh, patios and porches and backyards of various people's uh, houses in and around Baltimore. Um, and it, if you listen carefully to this podcast, you will hear, uh, you know, cicadas and birds and dogs uh, so let that be part of the, the ambiance, I guess, of the final product. Um, I got to interview authors. I got to interview historians, photographers, journalists, filmmakers, people who've all done their own work, uh, you know, chronicling Sparrow's Point. But, but really, most importantly, uh, I got to spend lots of time interviewing steelworkers themselves um, and just hearing them talk about what a day's work was like was just fascinating. I'm going to share a few clips with you uh, during this presentation. I'm actually going to sh uh, share, share my screen here and take you behind the podcasting curtain uh, and really show you uh, how the sausage gets made. Uh, let me see if I can open my, share my screen, share computer sound, share. I'm glad to be here, guys. I see your notes. I'm, this is, uh, I can't see any of you. It's actually a lot like doing a radio broadcast because I theoretically know you're there, but I'm kind of talking to myself at the same time. I'm used to talking to myself, though. Um, but <clears throat> I'm glad to know you're there. 
however abstractly, and that you're listening. Um, so you should be looking at uh, a program on my screen called Adobe Audition. I feel very shy showing anyone this uh, program. This is sort of like the, the audio producer's equivalent of uh, uh, you know showing you my messy bedroom. Do not judge the way this looks. Uh, this is basically what 15, 20 hours of raw audio looks like after it's been cut down to five hours and then digitally sliced and diced into thousands of different pieces that have been kind of shuffled and reshuffled according to you know, my vague notion of what the shape of this story is going to be. You're seeing a, a couple of minutes there. I'm going to zoom out so you can see what it, what, what it all looks like together. That's, that's many, many hours of audio cut into many, many different pieces. Um, <clears throat> it really is a work in progress. Um, so you are getting definitely a, a preview of something that is actively in development. Um, so we're going to focus on these gold audio bars here uh, for this uh, presentation. And um, let me share, let me just uh, kick it over to some voices from some steel workers here for you. I'm going to zoom in. You'll probably see me zooming in. And uh, I believe I've got my sound set up so that you will hear a gentleman named uh, Donald Forrest. Here we go. Bethlehem Steel was always in the distance, and the thing that always stood out to me as a kid is when they would dump the slag ladles over on Blast Furnace Road, the sky would light up orange like all of a sudden it was daytime. So that's Donald Forrest. He worked at Sparrows Point for uh, 34 years. My job was to, as the slag came out on the outside of the furnace in these spouts, they would go into these bowls. My job was, as that filled up, to pull a chain about 100 feet long and open that up and let it come down a trough to the next ladle and let it run in there. We had asbestos coats then that were silver, and we had a screen shield, and you'd put it up to your face and because the, the heat would just burn you. You had safety, and you would knock that sand dam and let it flow down to the next ladle. So you did that and got it done, and, you know, that was it. To be honest with you, when I first went there, my first three weeks, they put me on the blast furnace the second week I was there, and I almost quit. I wrapped my clothes up and my hot shoes and everything, and I was going to quit. This second guy you hear talking there, his name is Andrew Morton. He uh, started working at Bethlehem Steel in 1970. Uh, he did not have an auspicious start there, as you can hear. Uh, but he told me um, during our interview, there was an older guy there, uh, uh, a guy who worked with a, while well, he would smoke up, he always had a pipe in his mouth while he was working in this plant, uh, in the labor gang. Uh, and this old guy, he was having a, you know, uh, Andrew Morton was having a hard time. And the, the old guy kept asking him like, what's, what's, what's wrong? Young I man? said, sir, I, I can't do this kind of work. And he looked at me and he said, how do you know you can't do this kind of work? You didn't even try. I said, well, I, I, I'm just not made for this. He said, I'm going to tell you what, I'm not going to tell you not to quit. But I'm going to tell you this, if you quit now, you'll be a quitter the rest of your life. So uh, Mr. Morton did not quit. Uh, he says uh, everyone eventually gets a nickname down there at the plant. And he, he eventually earned a nickname of his own uh, from the older guys. And that nickname was, was Wild Man. I prided myself on being able to work as hard as them. And eventually I could outwork them. And they showed me the ins and outs. Because if you didn't listen to those, those older guys, you died. And quite a few of my friends, I lost five or six friends uh, down there. Uh, they got killed. You know, we turned the gas all the way up and we didn't care about all the smoke that we put out or anything. I mean, it was just production. So this guy you just heard uh, is Charlie Conklin. Uh, he started working at Sparrows Point back in 1959. And Charlie Conklin is uh, what they would call a white hat. He was a supervisor. He was an, in management. Um, and I, when I interviewed him, I think I, I realized, like, for as hard as the work was for the hourly workers, uh, the White Hats back then, it sounds like they had a pretty sweet gig. It was a good time. Uh, my, my boss, uh, superintendent, used to come in, and once a year, and he would say, Charlie, it's about time you got a little raise. You've done a good job. And, and he'd reach in his pocket because it was like on a Sunday and he'd have a long coat. He'd reach into his pocket and he'd give me a little note that said what my salary was going to be. Can you imagine that? Those were the days that, you know, it, it, it was a little bit different. 
So I think in the first episode of the series, uh, we're going to hear these uh, various uh, first-person stories uh, of workers and managers um, and really get a feel of what it was like to, to you know, walk a mile in their shoes. Um, and then I think in the next episode, we're going to get into the, the uh, we're going to kind of rewind the clock. We're going to get in the way back machine. We're going to travel back in time and really learn about the origin story of Sparrow's Point. Um, I had a great interview uh, with a guy by the name of Mark Reuter. He's a longtime journalist for the Sun Paper. Uh, he covered the Sparrow's Point beat, uh, such as it was in those final years of Sparrow's Point, and he eventually wrote um, you know, what's considered one of the definitive books about the mill. It's a book called Making Steel, The Rise and Ruin of, in, of American Industrial Might. Um, and and uh, Mr. Reuter, is, he's a great natural storyteller. I had a blast listening to him. Uh, here he is talking about when Frederick Wood of Pennsylvania Steel, before it was Bethlehem Steel, it was Pennsylvania Steel that... Uh, got this line on some good iron ore and they were prospecting a place to build a plant. So he, this guy, Frederick Wood was out on a prospect prospecting trip looking for a location for a steel mill. And this is uh, the first time he came across uh, Sparrow's point. There was just one house on it. It was the um, uh, house of an old um, ship captain. And um, people often said that captain Fitzel liked his isolated spot because it reminded him of being out at sea. Uh, Frederick Wood, through some lawyers in Baltimore, obtained the property and began this huge undertaking to build a state-of-the-art rail rolling mill uh, that would both serve domestic railroads and would be involved in international sales, which had never been really done before by the steel industry. And so that is the origins of Sparrow's Point when they began building around 1888. So they built this mill, uh, and they also built an entire self-contained company On town the around eve it. Of oh, and I should stop my. There we go. They built this uh, uh, company town around the mill, and this was a very um, sort of intentionally designed was as much thought was put into this town as the mill itself and and they grew and they grew on and on into the 20th century uh and uh, as world war ii approached they had you know more and more employees tens of thousands of employees we're talking black and white employees uh, but the jobs were all segregated as was the housing in this company town and um i should say a unionized workforce was not part of the the original managerial vision of, uh, of this enterprise. Um, but what I really, what was something important I came to learn is that a big part of the Sparrow's Point story is in fact the story of the rise of labor unions. And it's a, it's a story that's intertwined with the story of race, racism, civil rights at the plant. Uh, I'm gonna share a few clips here with you. First up, I'm gonna play uh, Deborah Rudisill. Uh, Deborah Rudisill, I had a great interview with her. She wrote a fantastic book. If you're interested in Sparrow's Point, find her book. It's called Roots of Steel. Here's Deborah. On the eve of World War II, the, the union was voted in to the plant. Steelworkers voted to accept the union. And that was a huge, huge change because the company town had always been very resistant to um, union organizing. I'm gonna play some more of Deborah uh, Rudisill in just a minute, but I'm gonna introduce one more uh, voice uh, into the mix here. This is labor historian, Bill Bailey. One of the problems when the contract for the steel industry was that they had segregated job classifications. And so if you were hired as many African-American workers, all of were into the labor gang, that was where you were gonna spend your whole 45 years. And so there were episodes starting as soon as the union came in by African-American workers bidding out, trying to get into maintenance jobs, trying to get into roller jobs, higher paid jobs, and they were effectively blocked. But it really wasn't until the lawsuit started a little later in the 1960s that the, the big changes came. Um, those lawsuits led to um, a consent, two consent decrees actually issued by the federal government, which mandated a move from unit seniority to plant seniority, right? So then it didn't matter. The, the main issue wasn't how long you had spent in your unit, but in the plant as a whole. So 
if you t get to talking to people about unions at Sparrows Point, you're inevitably going to hear one name come up over and over again, and that name is Eddie Barty. Uh, Mr. Barty was a he was a union legend, a union trailblazer. He was universally respected and admired by the steel workers there back in the day. Um, well, I should say by the black steel workers, he was universally respected and admired. He was made perhaps more begrudgingly respected and admired by the white steel workers. Um, and then perhaps <laughs> maybe more like uh, feared by the white management. Um, anyway, Mr. Barty, uh, he unfortunately passed away a few months before this podcast project started. Bill Berry has great interviews with him, by the way. Um, but I had the opportunity to interview uh, his son, Eddie Barty Jr., who spoke uh, really beautifully about his dad. I'm going to play Eddie Barty Jr. here for you. My father had a great impact on the steel industry because of the fact that once he became the vice president in 1962, they were able to go, they had a, a group called the Statesmen, which was a black group. And this was from Gary, Indiana, Illinois, Chicago, all the black steel companies had pockets of black people that were gathered together to go fight over Washington, D.C. to promote this incentive. So what it did, it promoted the black people to actually move up on the units and become crane operators, become truck drivers, and eventually to open the doors for blacks to start to become foremen. Um, so those uh, consent decrees you just heard being spoken about, they also forced open the door for women to come and work in all areas of Sparrows Point. Now, women had worked there in limited capacities in like clerical jobs. And there was also an all women unit in there called the Tin Floppers. And they've got their own story. Uh, they were like sequestered and they had this very matriarchal uh, supervisor. Um, and also, I should say during World War II, uh, there was a limited window of time during the war when women worked in very large numbers in uh, the shipyards, which were also a part of uh, Bethlehem Steel's uh, industrial footprint uh, here in Baltimore. Um, but that was a limited window of time. And it wasn't until the 1970s that, that all these jobs became open to women. Uh, the management actually had quotas they had to hit to put women in these jobs. Um, and there's this great generation of women of steel, they're called. Um, the Baltimore Museum of Industry has an exhibition called Women of Steel that, that, that features uh, women of this generation. They really were the pioneers uh, into these parts of the plant that no women had ever worked before, uh, doing these really heavy duty jobs. Um, and this podcast series is going to have an episode dedicated to them, to these women of steel. I'm going to share a few clips with you uh, of some of the women of steel uh, that I met. I said, I ought to go put an application in. And they laughed at me. <laughs> You know, my brother says, I don't think you could ever work down there. I said, why not? And he said, no, I don't think so. So that was like a challenge to me. <laughs> so I said, well, I'm going to go with you if you're going to go put an application in. So that's Kathy Garrison. She wished she did go with her brother and put an application in. She ended up at Bethlehem Steel working there for 37 years. Uh, she applied and got her letter of employment in uh, 1976. I got the letter, and when I showed it to my husband, he was like, uh, I don't, I don't really want you to work. And at that time there were, you know, it was very, very common for the, the man was the breadwinner. The woman was the homemaker and kind of old fashioned now, but he said, it's embarrassing for a man's wife to have to work. I said, why? He said, because it means he can't support his family. I can support my family. I said, yeah, but we could buy a house. And so I'm, you know, trying to convince him to let me work. He said to me, well, all right. You know, if you want to go down there, you can go down there, but you're going to have to keep up with your chores. <laughs> when I think of that now, I laugh because it's like, yeah. And he said, and if it starts to cause problems, you're going to quit. I want to play another clip from you, uh, from uh, Rita Hamlet. I had a blast hanging out with this woman. Um, I actually just went over uh, to her house to bring some CDs to her of her interview. Uh, she wanted to share them with her grandchildren. Uh, she got hired there in 1973. Here she is. When I got the job, I came home with my uniform on and went to my grandfather's house because my grandfather worked at Bethlehem Steel. And I came home with my uniform on. He said, you... I said, Dad, Granddaddy, I work down in Bethlehem still. He said, they hard women. I said, yes. I said, they hard me. 
Then one time my children came home and they said, Ma, we seen this woman on the bus. She was dressed just like a man, had on a, a, a thing, a hard hat on her head. So, see, every day when I got off of work, I took a shower and put my clothes back on. So I came home one day. I said, well, the woman y'all saw on the bus, was she dressed like this? They say, yeah, mom, she had the same thing on. I say, this is how I be dressed every day at work. I say, this is how you safeguard yourself. So, you know, then my children, I say, this is where your mother worked, at that same place down Bethlehem Steel. I say, that's why you're eating, because this is where your mother worked. Bill Berry, the labor historian I, I mentioned, um, when I talked with him, he says you can think of Sparrow's Point as an epic civilization. That really stuck with me, that, that kind of analogy. You know, it's complete with a rise and a fall. And, um, and the end of Sparrow's Point is this long, drawn out, and really painful kind of an end. Deborah Rudisill, she says, you know, it ended with a whimper. Uh, and what happened was Bethlehem Steel actually went bankrupt in 2001. And when that happened, the, all the retirees' pensions and benefits, health care, um, crumpled, basically evaporated. But Sparrow's Point, the plant itself didn't actually close until like 13 or 14 years after that bankruptcy because it went through this kind of revolving door of sale after sale after sale to like four or five different owners, several from uh, different countries around the globe. Um, the writing was on the wall for, for the American steel industry really for several decades before that. Um, I, got, I got a really in-depth explanation of the internal and external factors for the decline uh, in an interview with a, a plant manager who actually helped walk the company through that bankruptcy process. Um, and uh, his name is Dave Conrad. You'll hear from him in the series. But you'll also um, really hear about that experience from the, the workers uh, firsthand. I'm going to play you a collage of voices here um, of steel workers talking about the end of Sparrow's Point. When I first went... Oh, stand by one sec. You could have told me in 1970 that that mill would be gone in 2020, and I'd be like, you're out of here. You're crazy, man. That's never going to happen. The world caught up to us, and we did not change. We thought we were invincible. We thought Maryland couldn't survive without Bethlehem Steel, and that was a fantasy. Bethlehem Steel closed down because they owed the retirees $15 million. And the judge said, long as you're in existence, you're going to have to pay them. They shut the doors on a Friday and said, don't come in no more. Don't come in Monday. And as of Monday, you have no benefits. You know, we had people that committed suicide. It just went into a liquidation. They started tearing the plant down. And if you drive by there today, you'd never even know a steel mill ever existed. When I think of Bethlehem Steel, I think about the Roman Empire. And I think how industrial royalty became, well, right now it's dust. The, um, the end of Sparrow's Point uh, really did a number on the town of Dundalk. Uh, it left Dundalk in this kind of post-industrial funk uh, that it's still struggling to move on from, arguably. Dundalk uh, was basically built with military contract money around World War II to, as, to, to, as like housing expansion, to house the huge increase of workers at the mill. Um, I, I went there to Dundalk, hung out in a town square, uh, kind of town square style park in, right downtown, an area called Heritage Park. There's a monument to fallen steel workers there. Um, and that's where I interviewed a woman named Amy Menzer. She is, she is the director, executive director of a, a, a nonprofit that's called Dundalk Renaissance Corporation. They're focused on, you know, revitalizing Dundalk in the aftermath of these decades of, uh, you know, post-industrial decline. Um, and she says um, there are very real scars and very real kind of like post-traumatic stress about the closing of uh, Sparrow's Point, um, you know, there's, you can see it in the community, vacant homes, addiction issues, bitterness, wounded pride. Um, and also, you know, she, she said, quite honestly, 
uh, the, the impulse to find somebody to blame. Part of people's processing of what happened with job losses and economic decline gets mapped on to new people who move to the community who might be lower income and might be people of color as opposed to the more predominantly white population that was here in the community's heyday. And it leads to, I think, some false explanations that people make for themselves of what's the problem and why. Interesting conversation with her. Uh, and and I, I, I remember speaking with Deborah Rudisill about this idea as well of nostalgia um, and nostalgia having a dark side to it. Um, uh, Deborah Rudisill, I remember, told me it was originally classified as a mental illness, nostalgia, as natural as it is to all of us. Um, all right, moving on here. I'm going to uh, walk us up to the present. The end of Sparrow's Point steel mill, right, is not the end of the story of Sparrow's Point proper. The land is still there. There's a, a very, really interesting post-industrial um, phoenix that's risen from the ashes on that spot. Um, in 2014, the peninsula got bought by a company uh, called Trade Point Atlantic. Uh, and this company saw, uh, well, it saw a mound of rubble, basically, and an environmental mess. Um, but it also saw a place that, that was really well situated infrastructure-wise. Um, it's right on a deep water port. It's connected to two class one railroads. Uh, it's right next to two major highways, 695 and 295. So this company, Trade Point Atlantic, they got to work capping off the environmental contaminants, redesigning the spot as uh, like an industrial park uh, for a variety of different tenants. Um, you probably heard of one of them, a little company called Amazon uh, is on the spot. They have a major distribution hub on Sparrows Point. Uh, I, vi I visited uh, Trade Point Atlantic and, um, and I talked with the company's senior VP of corporate affairs, uh, a fellow named Aaron Tamarchio. And he said, basically, you know, when when something is dead, you you can't just wish it back to life as much as you would like to. It's natural to feel that way. You can remember, you can honor, but time rolls on, and you need to you need to roll on with it. The moral of the story is, you need to have a vision for the future. You need to be able to be open minded to embrace parts of that vision. You may not agree with the entire vision, but at least you agree that, you know, you need to move forward um, and not just hearkening back to the past or, or keeping things the way they always are, because that is not a recipe for success. Bethlehem Steel was a little microcosm of society as a whole. And even in today's world and in today's politics, I think you see it playing out. That second voice you heard just there uh, is Dave Conrad, former executive at uh, Bethlehem Steel. He makes his point this way, he says, um, around the time when Bethlehem Steel, or, uh, when Sparrow's Point closed down, there were about 3,000 workers who lost their jobs when the mill finally closed. And now, if you look at the numbers, there are about 3,000 new jobs created at Trade Point Atlantic. So from a net impact, 3,000 jobs of a steel mill went away and 3,000 jobs for distribution centers were gained. On the surface, what's the problem? But the difference is those 3,000 new jobs are paying about half probably of the 3,000 older jobs. I think one of the big takeaways here is that the decline of Sparrows Point ran parallel historically to the decline in the power of labor unions. Those Amazon jobs, they're not union jobs. And then when you, when you zoom out and you think about this larger gig worker economy that's all around us right now, those jobs are a far cry from union jobs. I'm going to play one final clip here for you before we uh, open it up and uh, hear from you guys. Uh, this is Deborah Rudisill again. Um, I think she gives us uh, some good food for thought as we get ready to, to um, move on from this story. Here's Deborah. There was a real sense of, of solidarity. And I think that that's 
one of the things that we have lost over the past few decades and we're really suffering for that. Now it seems as though everybody considers themselves a free agent, you know, and they're going to rise or fall through their own efforts. Well, if the Sparrows Point story shows that that's baloney. As an individual, you can't do anything to fight a big company. As an individual, you can't do anything to fight the government for that matter. You need to be working together with other people in a bigger, more powerful unit in order to get things done and make things better, not just for yourself, but for everyone else. And that is the lesson that I take away from the Sparrows Point story. And I think we're beginning to see glimmers of that in the country now in this terrible time with the, the pandemic and the job loss and the political divisions. We're starting to see, though, people beginning to come together again and to recognize that, hey, we need each other. And if we hope to make not just any progress, but if we hope to survive, we have to come together and demand change. All right, I'm going to stop sharing my screen here. Um, and uh, I'm going to, I, I would love to just uh, open it up to, I know uh, there are folks in the audience who were interviewed as part of this project. Uh, I'd be uh, curious to hear, um, you know, who else is uh, listening, what questions you might have about, you know, I'm happy to field questions about sort of what I learned and come to understand about Sparrows Point as, you know, an amateur uh, historian, podcaster, you know, sort of take, approaching this story uh, from ground zero uh, as a blank slate. Um, I'm still learning about the story. Um, and uh, I'm also happy to, you know, talk shop about, um, you know, podcasting and, and the editorial process and, and sort of what goes into structuring this into what you're ultimately going to be hearing in, uh, in January. Um, I don't know. Let me look in the Q&A se section here. Oh. Look at this. Okay. Um, let's see. Open three. Oh, I see. Here they are. Uh, okay. So I'll read this. Uh, the Beacon of Hope Project, formed and designed by the Sparrows Point North Point Historical Society, a memorial. Ah, this is um, this is someone um, filling in more information about that uh, uh, monument. Oh no, I know who this is. This is, I interviewed, uh, okay. So the Beacon of Hope Project, uh, formed and designed by the Sparrows Point North Point Historical Society, uh, a memorial to the workers and veterans of Bethlehem Steel, which aims to relocate several historical cast iron lampposts from the grounds of the former Bethlehem Steel plant, uh, which is now the site of Trade Point Atlantic, to Sparrows Point High School. Um, these lampposts are, are being moved and then they're going to get retrofitted with solar uh, and they're teaching the students about solar energy in the process. It's the first solar project in Baltimore County public schools. Lampposts are enduring reminders of America's industrial heritage uh, and once restored and updated with solar technology are going to illuminate the pathway to education, athletics, environmental programs for new generations of Sparrows Point students. Um, yes, I... I I have to uh, take a second here and um, and let you guys know um, that this is a passion project of um, one of the uh, many folks that I uh, that I interviewed. I'm going to just uh, look. Hold on one quick second here. Um, yeah, I had a I had a great conversation with uh, with this guy. His name is Keith Taylor. And I'm going to show you something cool that he gave me. He, so Keith Taylor, uh, the guy who wrote this note, he's listening along. Good. To, I'm glad to have you with us, Keith. Um, he is like a impassioned amateur historian. He went basically when um, Trade Point Atlantic was first kind of getting organized and, and getting rid of the, all the industrial debris uh, on the site. This guy, Keith, he, um, he went, uh, he went to the site and he collected uh, like bricks out of the dumpsters. Um, and he made these monuments uh, or these like, uh, my, I'm going to show you something. It's right here. Keith gave me this. He makes this, he makes these for people and gives them to him. The, this is a brick from the original uh, headquarters building. And Keith told me, if you look really closely, you can see those little, uh, gray dots in there. 
the, the bricks, when they were made, they were made with slag, this byproduct of steel, which was in great supply. Basically, the entire you know, peninsula was covered with it. And they used it. They literally used their byproduct as building materials for their growing plant. Keith Taylor is a fascinating character. He's doing great um, historical work and uh, work to preserve the heritage of um, uh, Sparrow's Point. Uh, I'm, I'm glad to see your comment there, Keith. Um, here is a question that says, in your interviews and research, do you feel like people have come to a place of reconciliation and understanding about the legacy of Beth Steele? How are folks doing in terms of healing from this experience? I spoke with a lot of steel workers who still missed up when they talk about the end of that plant. People over and over again talked about it as being part of a family. I've taught, I met steel workers who found father figures there that they didn't have at home. I talked with steel workers there who spent, I mean, they spent so much more time with each other in such extreme hazardous circumstances. A lot of them, you know, it was like they, they it was like they, they referred to it as going to war together. Um, and that kind of camaraderie, I think, is just probably almost irreplaceable. Um, I mean, I feel close to the people that I work with in my office job, but I think handling molten steel with people 365 days of the year, no matter what the weather is like outside, probably gives you a kind of camaraderie that a lot of us can only imagine. Um, that said, when I, as, as best as I understand it, when Bethlehem Steel declared bankruptcy, they offered um, job retraining programs for uh, the workers. And a lot of them, a lot of the workers took them up on that and really uh, re-educated themselves in, you know, other areas of interest and moved on to like Andrew Morton, who you heard on, uh, heard early on in the, in the podcast. He became fascinated with uh, computers. He actually became fascinated with computers while he was still working there. He ended up creating a software instruction manual, basically for the entire plant that they rehired him as a contractor while he was still a hourly worker. Um, but people, you know, time rolls on, people move on. Um, but I also heard people say, you know, when you had this kind of paternalistic capitalism that was that fully encompassed your entire life you were really kind of a babe in the woods when that disappeared in terms of basic skills of like how do i make a resume how do i even you know how do i interact with a computer personal computer i mean um i kathy garrison said she worked with brilliant people every day but they didn't know how to use computers because they had no reason to. That wasn't part of their necessary daily experience. And so, you know, folks were really left reeling and wondering what to do next. And, um, you know, I think it probably varies person to person um, how much how much pain. It, it really is a grieving process for, for the people who were there. And different po folks grieve at different paces. Um, was there anything especially surprising to you in the process of interviewing this wide range of folks connected to the Bethlehem Steel story, something you didn't expect to discover? Um, everything was surprising to me. It was, um, I think, I think the, the fact that folks just accepted that level of danger and hazard every day and didn't blink and just accepted that as this is my way to make a living. This is my way to provide for a family. And you know what? Every day I go to work and put those boots on and walk in there. I'm rolling the dice statistically with my health and safety. But they did it anyway. And along with it came this great sense of pride. I mean, they were at the center of the industrial universe. And in World War II, they were 
doing, a, they were doing their patriotic duty. Their steel was in the holes of these ships. Their steel was in the plates of these tanks. Um, it was, it was an identity. I think that's what was one of the things that really hit home with me is that this, this job really became your identity. Um, here is a question for, and I'm keeping an eye on the time here. Uh, here's a question from uh, Jeffrey. Uh, he says, amazing content so far. Can't wait for the final product. As an admitted outsider coming into the project, what surprised you most about the history of the plant and what was most expect, what most unexpected from your perspective? Um, I think what I learned the most about in the process of this was the the importance of labor unions and the 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 political importance of labor unions and the fact that the labor union movement and the civil rights movement and the racial justice movement were all so intertwined with each other those things I think in my mind before I did this project were much more sort of compartmentalized historical items. And it was a real education for me um, to, to begin to understand just how much those things overlapped and depended on, on each other. Um, <laughs> an anonymous attendee says, how can I get one of those bricks? You know, you got to talk to Keith. You got to talk, talk to Keith Taylor. Um, all right, let's see here. Um, how did we select our interview subjects? Um, well, the the BMI, I tell you, it was great to partner with the BMI because they have such a um, great list of resources, um, you know, folks that they've, they've had um, in their exhibits, in their events. Um, and so we started with a running list of, of folks that the BMI recommended. And then I do, I did basically what I, what I always do when I'm making any story, which is every person I meet, I say, who else do I want to make sure to meet? And, you know, people that I would interview um, would give me, you know, a couple other names or, you know, in the case of Bill Barry, I feel like I owe Bill a producer credit on this because he gave me lists and lists of people um, who, you know, I, I was able to meet through him um, and who ended up as part of this project. So it was, it was, uh, it's always, it's like a daisy chain. Um, and, you know, you can't get a hold of some people and, um, you know, time, the inexorable rolling on of time. Some folks, I, you know, I, I called uh, one man who was, you know, his health had declined too much to, for him to be able to do an interview. I called another woman and she had had a stroke and wasn't comfortable with her, the way her speech sounded at this point. These folks are, they're older now. The, you know, the, the generation, the voices that really give you the history, um, time is always ticking. Um, so I'm just, I'm grateful for the ones that I, that I did get to, to record with. I think we ended up with a pretty, pretty awesome cross section. Um, this was a wonderful looking behind the scenes. Uh, thanks very much. First question is how do you go about making a story out of something like this? Uh, how do you find a narrative thread? I'm asking myself that same question uh, currently. Um, we, you know, I, there's some basic, uh, luckily you're dealing with a story that has a chronology. It has a beginning, it has a sort of a rise to power, it has a decline, and then it has a bitter end, and then it has this sort of phoenix uh, that happens at the end that is, you know, different people have different opinions about. That's kind of the, and then there are, as I say, you break out into these sidebars and, you know, say for an episode, we're really going to focus on the stories of women of steel. Um, when you have an episode, it, it was, it's nice to create something that's a limited series. This isn't a podcast that's going to show up every week in your podcast feed ad infinitum. So I know I need to get that story in, in six episodes. And right now it's, it's a matter of, there's always, there's, there's two things with a story. There's, there's the content of the story and then there's how you choose to tell the story and that how you choose to tell it is, is, um, is what I'm really putting my uh, time into now and thinking, you know what, that first episode isn't going to be, um, the beginning of the story of Sparrow's Point. 
it's going to be the story of those steel workers. And then you're going to wait till episode two until we go back and hear about when Sparrows Point was this marshy, isolated peninsula. And then we're going to go, you know, take these other dovetails. Um, one of the things I'm looking forward to with this podcast um, is that I, I get to help tell the story as well. I, I do another podcast, another radio show and podcast uh, out of the blocks. And that's produced in a very different way where I do these interviews, um, but then I cut myself out of the interviews and you meet people much more in a much more impressionistic way in their own words. Um, so I'm looking forward to getting to be a voice in this story as well to help be that mortar between the bricks, to help create those segues, to help zoom out and, and think alongside my listeners about what we've heard. Um, so to be determined is the short answer to that question, uh, Paul. I'm, I'm still working on it, but it's, it is the pieces fall into place the more and more you listen to the audio and play around with it. Um, okay, so we've got, I think, about eight more minutes. I'll, take, I'll do a couple more of these. You guys ask great questions. Would you be able to uh, give a timeline of the life of the mill? I know next to nothing. How long was it in operation? Okay, so the, the, the goalposts of the timeline, as I understand them, was late 1880s was when they started building the mill. It was 88 or 89 when they basically like when um, what was then Pennsylvania Steel um, found this location that they uh, liked because it was on the Atlantic coast. Um, they had found uh, lots of rich deposits of iron ore in Cuba on the cliffs in Cuba. And so they, want, and, and this was, was such good stuff compared to what they had in Pennsylvania, that it was worth it to them to build this mill that was going to be on a port on the east coast of the United States so they could run ships back and forth to bring this iron ore. I also learned, by the way, how steel is made. We're going to learn that at some point in the podcast too, which steel is greatly superior to iron in its um, uh, durability. Um, and it was, it was sort of a byproduct of the civil war and the railroads being built that, you know, that steel really became kind of an, an, a necessity because the rails were just, the, the trains were just hammering these iron railroads and just making a mess out of these tracks. And there was such upkeep. They were like, okay, we, we gotta, we gotta embrace steel here now that we have the technology. And there was, there's a great story about, there's a kind of furnace called a Bessemer converter that they had figured out in England that if you actually cool the air in this furnace, you can get that iron ore hotter, which boils out more of the impurities and makes better steel. And um, Mark Reuter told me the first, so they tried, to, they tried to ship this Bessemer converter over the first one to the United States, but the ship sank. So the very, the very first Bessemer converter uh, is somewhere at the bottom of the Atlantic Ocean that was supposed to come to the United States. I think they eventually made a, a replica of it, and then they were off to the races. Uh, I'm, I can tell, you can tell I'm, I'm sidetracking myself. Back to your question. The timeline, it wasn't until a couple of decades later that <clears throat> Pennsylvania Steel uh, sold the Sparrows Point location, which was a full-on operating steel mill in town at that point, to a company called Bethlehem Steel, also in Pennsylvania. So Bethlehem Steel has other locations, other, you know, plants around the country, and Sparrows Point is, you know, one major plant uh, of Bethlehem Steel. And so it became Bethlehem Steel in, uh, I don't want to say a number because I can't remember it offhand, Early in like the teens, I want to say. And, and then it stayed Bethlehem Steel until 2001, when Bethlehem Steel declared bankruptcy mainly to relieve itself of the debt that it owed to its retirees in the form of pensions and health care. And once it went through that bankruptcy restructuring, it was able to, it, it was able to run uh, functionally again. And then it got bought by four or five different companies. There was a company, uh, uh, RG Steel, Severstall is a company from Russia that bought them. Mittal Steel from India bought them, and then it got bought by a liquidator who basically bought it and immediately scrapped it and sold it for parts. And that was 2012, 2013, and then 2014 is when Trade Point Atlantic came on the scene and began to redesign it to what it is today. 
man, I hope, I know you guys are listening and I know I didn't quite get those dates right. I'll have them, I'll have them proofread and absolutely correct by the time I get the podcast out. But that's my rough timeline for you. All right, um, let me see. I've got uh, another, let me double check my, uh, is that clock right? I've got maybe three or four minutes here. Uh, okay, um, it's 7.55 right now. So I'm gonna take a couple more of these. Um, I really appreciate the intersectional nature of some of the episodes, but a question arises of how universal is this experience throughout the country? Yeah, as a more personal, specific example, I have family in Shreveport, Louisiana, where a paper mill closure had a huge impact on that area. What lessons have we as a country, as a society, learned from events like the closure of Sparrows Point and how we deal with the aftermath? Um, great question. and. Yeah, every local radio station and every city's uh, museum of industry ought to get together and do a version of this podcast on their region and the industrial past of, it, of their region. I'm sure these stories, the narrative arc, the general arc of this story is, is repeated in some form or fashion all over the country and ha or has been over the past decades. Um, certainly the steel industry at large all over the country had this same thing happen to it. And, you know, our history, our chapter of history as an industrial giant, whatever that industry is, has had that similar rise and fall. And when you talk to um, economists and labor historians, they'll point out that we, we don't have an industrial economy that's anything like what it was in the 50s, in the 60s, even on into the 70s and 80s. We have a service economy now. We have a logistics economy. We have a distribution economy. And those things that we move around, that we distribute, that we manage the logistics for, they come from other countries. And those other countries are the ones with those manufacturing jobs. Um, that may be simplistic to say, but I think that's a trend um, that probably applies um, across the country. I'm a third generation steel worker of Bethlehem Steel and was floored when it really closed. You were not alone, obviously. It was, it was skull numbing to so many people who just, you know, didn't know what, to, literally didn't know what to do when they woke up the next day. Technical question. The quality of the audio clips was crystal clear on my end. Good. Um, did you get people to come to a studio or were you able to clean up remote recorded recordings or some of both? Okay. Um, I re I, you might have joined a couple of minutes late. I'm going to reiterate the, the trick here, which is that I spent a lot of time. Um, I visited people in person, but all those recordings are done on site at people's porches and patios and front yards. They're all done outdoors at a safe social distance. I had my microphone. We had 15 feet of cable. They had their microphone. And we sat, we talked, and they, I made sure they were nice and close to their microphone, uh, even though they were far away from me. And so I was, I was saying uh, at the beginning of this presentation, if you listen carefully, you will hear like cicadas and birds and dogs barking in the back of this uh, audio. But I am grateful. I, some people I, gather, I did by phone as well. There are a couple of phone voices, but I was really glad to be able to, and I was happy that people were willing to, you know, to, to take that measured risk. Um, and to get together at a safe social distance. Um, the recordings, you know, they did turn out great. Um, so, yeah, it's a, it's, it will be a, a, a surprisingly listenable podcast in terms of its audio quality in the, in the era of COVID. All right, that's about the top of the hour. Uh, I, there's so many other great questions. Um, I, uh, I love these questions, and I love that you guys are interested. It's, it's been an honor and really fun to, to talk with you guys about this process. Um, I should tell you, if you Google WYPR Sparrows Point, it'll take you to the page that we've already created. And I did something, um, we podcasters, when we make a new podcast, we make something like, like a movie trailer. It's a podcast trailer. So there's a little mini episode that's like three minutes long that already exists. Um, at this page so that you can log on there and you can hit subscribe. So whatever your podcast player is, once that first episode comes out in January, it'll already be, it'll, your phone will ping you. and It'll be like the first episode of, of uh, Sparrow's Point is in your, you know, in your device.
So uh, yeah, go to uh, Google WIPR. Oh, here's, there it is. How to subscribe. Thank you guys for showing that. Um, there's the link. Get on there. Uh, hit subscribe. It's going to be on all the podcast players too. Spotify, Google Podcasts. I just got an email from my uh, web director today that Apple Podcasts approved it. It may take a day or two before it's searchable on there, but it won't be hard to find. And um, yeah, you can definitely um, get yourself hooked up early and in advance uh, at the WIPR site. All right. I've talked myself out. Um, it's been fun. Thank you for listening. Listening is an act of love. I never take it for granted when people listen to me. Um, I, I appreciate you guys and, and I'm looking forward to um, giving you uh, this project in its entirely, entirety in, uh, in about a month. I'm going to hit mute here and I'll, I'll turn it back over to uh, Anita Kassoff. Oh, thank you so much, Aaron. I have goosebumps. I am I, I, so psyched. I cannot wait to listen to this podcast. So thank you. And thank you to our supporters and members because you made this possible. So subscribe, tune in. If you're not yet a member, please consider becoming a member tonight um, because your membership matters. You make programs like this possible. Thank you and have a good night, everybody.